Good morning, uh, everybody, and welcome to this last plenary session. It's a great pleasure to be in this extraordinary hall here. It's like being in an opera, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy the show also this morning. Uh, in the name of my uh, co-chair, Steve Aouka, uh, you will notice from the program that Jean-Jacques Mouyembe could not be with us, so he's been replaced by one of his colleagues uh, from uh, the ENRB in Kinshasa. Uh, and my name is Christian Lengler. I'm with the Swiss TPH in, in Basel in Switzerland. Uh, moving on to the first presentation by Professor Umberto D'Alessandro. Uh, Umberto is a dear colleague and friend. He is currently the director of the MRC, the Medical Research Council unit in the Gambia. Uh, as you know, it's a very prestigious uh, institution that made many seminal contributions in the field of tropical medicine. Uh, Umberto is also a professor of epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, he's a very well-known and established figure in our field. He started his life as a clinician uh, in uh, Kenya and uh, Benin. And then fortunately for us, he switched fields. He became a clinical epidemiologist. And for the past 20 years, 25 years, he's been very active in many areas. Uh, working uh, also among other for 10 years here at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in uh, Antwerpen and now, uh, as I said, with the MRC in Gambia. So, Umberto, uh, welcome. Uh, your topic is elimination challenges uh, and outlooks, and I'm sure you will not be short of any of those. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Christian. Uh, and first of all, I would like to thank uh, my friend, uh, Professor Marlene, Marlene Boulard and all the organizers of this meeting for having invited me to uh, this, uh, this fantastic meeting. Um, as Christian said, uh, I'm the director of the Medical Research Council unit in the Gambia, which this year uh, celebrates 70, 70 years of activity. Um, so, as Christian said also, this is a quite prestigious unit with uh, 1,200 staff and we do quite a lot of work in different areas, including malaria. Uh, the other things about the Gambia is that this is the smallest uh, African country on mainland, but uh, it's a country that gave a lesson to other countries because it shook away the dictator of 22 years, Yaya Jame, just last January. Anyway, let's go to malaria elimination. What are the available tools and new challenges? Uh, I think this one, I was in the session uh, where Christian was, who also showed this uh, slide. And this appeared uh, in, uh, uh, in 2015 in Nature, and it just showed the fantastic progress that we have witnessed these last 10 or 20, 15 years uh, in terms of, mala of malaria control. If you look here at the uh, picture of uh, uh, Africa, uh, malaria prevalence um, in sub-Saharan Africa in 2000, and when you look at the colors where red means the highest prevalence, and you look at, the, at this picture here of 2015 where most of the, uh, of the colors have shifted to blue, it means that there's, there's been a huge progress in terms of malaria control. And this bottom uh, figure shows that the darker green are the places where the progress has been more uh, important. So you see that even in countries like uh, DRC, there has been a huge progress. So uh, fantastic news, but malaria is still there. Uh, transmission is still ongoing. Looking at the estimate from the um, uh, malaria war report of last year, actually the next, the next report, the, the report for 2017, is going to be launched at the end of November. Uh, if you look at the malaria cases from 2000 2015, for, uh, 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 you see that for uh, PFAL Ciparum, there's been a huge decrease of 14%. Uh, we still have uh, about 200, uh, a bit more than 200 million cases. Um, and for Vivax, uh, there's been an even, uh, even bigger uh, decrease. And, and looking at each, because Africa is the place where PFAL Ciparum is more prevalent, if we look at the, uh, at the single uh, in, uh, countries and we look at the trend of cases, we see that generally speaking, there is a trend, a decreasing trend, except maybe for 
a few countries like, for example, Gabon, Mali, and Rwanda. But everywhere else, we, we, we observe a decrease in the number of cases reported. Similarly, for, for mortality or malaria mortality, which is extremely difficult to define because uh, uh, it's very difficult to attribute to malaria certain deaths, and sometimes malaria is an indirect cause of death for other causes. Uh, if we, uh, we look at the, at the estimated death here from 2000 to 2015, uh, we had a decrease a bit of 22% from 2000 to 2015, uh, with about a bit less probably the half a million debt. Uh, and similarly, there is a huge decrease in the uh, deaths due to Vivax, although these, the deaths due to Vivax are much less compared to the deaths due to Plasmodium falciparum. And um, knowing that the, the mortality is much higher in children under five, particularly in Africa children, and you look at the estimate uh, deaths in the under five, you see that there's even a, a significant decrease there as well, mi minus 29%. And again, here the trend seems to go down in every single country, African country. So this is due to uh, uh, substantial commitment, financial commitment from different donors. Uh, and if you look here at the, um, uh, at the amount of, of billion US dollars that have been uh, uh, committed to the fight against malaria, it has increased sharply from 2005 to 2009 and afterwards have reached a plateau. And here you have the different component, different donors that are uh, giving, uh, donating um, uh, resources for, for, for malaria control. And uh, when uh, looking at the type of, of financing, what, what, what these donors finance, the government, of course, finance primarily the health system, while the Global Fund and the President Malaria Initiative funds essentially or mostly uh, commodities like bed nets, like treatment, uh, and very little health system. Uh, this is again taken from the uh, Malaria Award uh, report 2016, and it's quite interesting because it shows the different donors on one side, on the left side, uh, you see here, uh, here are the governments of endemic country uh, and how the amount of, of, of funding that goes to, uh, to endemic country. Uh, and obviously US, uh, USA, UK are the, among the biggest donors after the, the, the governments in endemic country. And then you have other contributions like France, Germany, Japan, Canada, and here it is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, EU, and so on and so forth. Uh, some of this funding goes to the Global Fund, um, uh, and the Global Fund uh, is extremely important for malaria control because it, 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 it provides the, the funding to maintain the uh, gain we, ha we are uh, having today. So it's mainly uh, funding for uh, buying bed nets, buying treatment, buying diagnostic tests. So the other question here is what is going to happen to this fund in USA uh, once uh, President Trump decide to revise this, but we don't know really. Okay, so let's talk about malaria elimination. This is not a, a new idea. Uh, there was a global malaria eradication program that was launched in the 50s um, that was based, this was the sort of uh, roadmap um, of, of the global eradication program. And it's a quite simplistic approach because, uh, oops, a quite a simplistic approach because basically they wanted to interrupt transmission with uh, vector control activity, mainly DDT, um, and then um, so you have the, here is the, the res human reservoir, uh, uh, the parasite reservoir, interrupt transmission with DDT, the parasite reservoir would be eliminated, and once uh, this would be eliminated, then we could have uh, stopped. Uh, 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 spring activity, and then even if the vector would have been there, he wouldn't have transmitted the, uh, the, the, the disease or the infection. I mean, this is a quite simplistic approach, and now we realize that uh, interrupting transmission, eliminating malaria, or eradicating malaria needs a more articulate response, and also a response that is uh, adapted to the local circumstances. So, 
uh, the failure of the eradication program uh, caused a sort of uh, uh, depression, I would say, across the world in terms of how are, we are going to control malaria, how we are going to reduce the burden. And for quite a long time, um, the E-word, say the E-word, so the elimination and eradication was basically forbidden. Forbidden. So no malariologists who talk about eradication, no malariologists who talk about elimination because of the failure of the, of the previous program. But we have here um, uh, a billionaire, American billionaire, uh, who, who founded a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and decided to help the world in solving some of his most pressing problems, including health problems. And so in 2007, um, Bill and Melinda uh, Gates uh, announced to the world that they want to go for eradication. And everybody was really stunned about this because, and this is, uh, this is reflected by the title into the, of this journal, did they really say eradication? So something, a word that could not be pronounced before. And uh, well, then people say, well, you know, well, maybe we should think about it. Is it possible at all? And uh, just to make some clarity on some concept uh, between uh, the difference between eradication and elimination, um, so eradication is a permanent reduction to zero of the worldwide incidence of malaria as a result of time-bound deliberate effort. And I think this is very important, uh, time-bound deliberate effort. So that means that you go in, you try to stop transmission, transmission has, inter uh, has stopped everywhere in the world, then you stop your effort and you don't, need, you don't fear any reintroduction. Uh, so it's basically wiping out malaria across the world. Elimination is very different. It's reduction to zero of the incidence of malaria in the defined geographical area as a result of deliberate efforts. So it means that you can eliminate malaria in a given country or in, even in a region in a country, but you have neighbor region where there is still uh, malaria transmission, so malaria can be reintroduced. So it means that you need to continue to control for malaria. You need to con have me measures that prevent the reestablishment of, of the transmission. And for the time being, we are talking nowadays about elimination. And some countries have been uh, able to eliminate malaria. A few countries have been able to eliminate malaria. But other countries are on the path of eliminating malaria, but not quite there. So uh, this announcement of uh, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, was followed by discussion. And eventually, the WHO uh, tried to, uh, in a way, I would say, but not in a negative way, jump into the wagon and, and they managed to, into, uh, a few months later, to uh, uh, really uh, formulate a, a global malaria action plan for a malaria-free world. This was followed, and um, very recently, by a framework for malaria elimination by the Global Malaria Program, in which, in actual fact, before we are distinguishing between uh, uh, countries uh, applying malaria control measure, countries going for elimination. Nowadays, all countries should work towards the goal of malaria elimination, regardless of the intensity of transmission. So in, ad, in actual fact, the control of malaria, the decrease of a public health burden of malaria, is, is just one stage the, on the path of eliminating and then eradicating malaria. So, and uh, this framework is it's based on four pillars and then two uh, sort of uh, basements. Um, one pillar is uh, ensure universal access to malaria prevention diagnosis. This is absolutely essential. Everybody should have access to um, standard, standard diagnostic, uh, diagnostic and, and treatment. Everybody should have access to standard prevention measures, which are insecticide bed nets, uh, which are intermittent preventive treatment for pregnant women, seasonal malaria chemo prevention for children under five, and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> the pillar two, you have accelerated effort towards elimination and attainment of malaria-free status. And this is something in which, for which we researchers, scientists, we are particularly uh, interested because we can contribute a good deal into this. And then third, transform malaria surveillance into a core intervention. And, of, and at the basis of it, you have research and then the strengthening the, the enabling environment. So I have an environment that allows you to apply and implement all the interventions that you want to implement. <clears throat> so, uh, 
So uh, this is a very, very uh, ambition goal. So you have that by 2020 to reduce uh, by at least 40%. And for the level we had in 2015, which is really already, they're already uh, very low, uh, or relatively low, uh, at reduce further malaria mortality by at least 40%. Uh, by 2025, to reduce it at least uh, 75%, and then in 2030, by at least 20%. The same apply for morbidity, the malaria case incidence compared to 2015, and then uh, have at least 10 countries, and usually, at, you know, up to now, the countries that have recently announced to, to have eliminated malaria, I think the last one was Sri Lanka last year. Uh, are the countries where the transmission was already very low and were at the edge of the transmission uh, area. So to have had other, at least 10 countries by 2020 who declare, that declare to have eliminated malaria, uh, at least 20 countries in 2025, and at least 35 countries in 2030. And of course, uh, this uh, uh, elimination, which is a process where in which uh, in which the country are certificated that they are free of malaria, um, it should uh, be uh, coupled with a uh, measure that, uh, that prevent the reestablishment of malaria. Because in actual fact, here you have elimination, so you have other countries where malaria transmission is ongoing. So, uh, well, I mentioned these, uh, the, the global strategy for malaria, so we have different four components. The component A, which is again universal access, uh, and component B, so increase the surveillance to be able to detect where malaria transmission occurs, uh, characterize and monitor all cases to, to know where they're coming from. Um, and then uh, component C, where again, this is where we are most uh, interested in accelerated transmission reduction, so deployment of additional timely efficient intervention to reduce transmission efficiency. So you have mass drug administration, for example, vaccine, but other approaches that I'm going to talk about later. Uh, and then the component D that investigate and clearing individual cases, managing foci and, fo and, fo and following them up. So in this case, when you have malaria elimination, find it a few uh, close to, I mean, when you are close to uh, malaria elimination, find the few remaining infection and foci and, and then really uh, wipe them out. This is, uh, these four components are uh, expressed graphically in this slide. Um, and then, again, as I said before, you have the continuum of transmission from high to low, to low, moderate low, to very low, to zero, and then monitoring zero, so to prevent uh, reintroduction. And obviously, uh, the component A and component B are uh, relevant for the, any, any intensity of transmission but component C and component D particularly are particularly re re relevant when the transmission is low to very low or you are very close to zero. So everything is fine, but you know, of course, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's not easy, first of all, but you know, on top of that, we have to think that the vector and the parasite are biological system. They are very plastic and they can adapt to uh, uh, changing condition. And one of the major threats for these plants are the emergence of artemisinin resistant in Southeast Asia, particularly at, at the Cam Thai Cambodian border. Uh, here you see the artemisinin resistance was first uh, characterized by a, a, a delay in clear clearance of parasitemia of, of infection um, when a patient were treated with artemisinin based combination. And uh, this uh, delay in clearance has been uh, associated with the occurrence of a particular mutation in the K13 uh, gene of the parasite, Plasmodium falciparum, and the red, uh, the red uh, uh, zone, uh, the red area, correspond to the prevalence of this uh, mutation that confers resistance to artemisinin. A and you can see that there are places where actual fat, this, this, this uh, uh, mutation is uh, highly prevalent. Although uh, people have said, well, oh, these people, it is true, they, they show a delay in uh, clearance of parasitemia, but uh, eventually they are cured. This is true, but this delay uh, actually make the, the, the partner drug in the combination more vulnerable. 
and unfortunately we have seen in, uh, in Cambodia, here you have the, uh, the success rate, oops, sorry, the success rate of, uh, of artesanate mefloquine in red, the artemisium piperacone in, in black, and here you have 100% efficacy, right? Uh, 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 and you can see that the didotermism piperaquine here, for example, here, uh, uh, has an efficacy that is less than optimal. That means that also the piperaquine component in the combination is failing. And this uh, resistance to, of piperaquine has been associated uh, uh, to a particular um, gene in the, in the parasite that make it, the copy number is increased, uh, the, the, of this gene is increased, and, and it makes the, the parasite more resistant to the treatment. So these are uh, really the threat for this sort of roadmap that uh, will bring, bring us to malaria elimination. The other, the other threat, which I didn't put it here, is insecticide resistance, of course, which may be, is, uh, may, may be also problematic. So the other point I want to make is that malaria elimination, so the effort for malaria elimination needs to be uh, continued even when uh, the burden of malaria is going to be extremely low. And this is what we observed in Sri Lanka many years ago when uh, following the, uh, the decrease, substantial decrease of malaria cases, the uh, 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 IRS, which is indoor disease spraying, was stopped. You can see a quick increase on malaria cases. And similarly, in Zanzibar, we observed the same problem. The program was, malaria program, uh, malaria control program was altered, and then again, we have uh, increase of parasite prevalence from less than 5% to uh, 50%. So it means that when you engage in malaria elimination, you cannot, uh, in a sense, relax before you have um, basically eradicated the, or, the, or eliminated to very, very low uh, level the risk of reintroduction of, of, of malaria infection. So what's the problem for, I mean, one of the main problems for, for malaria elimination is the human reservoir. Um, uh, it is still unclear what is the role of, of this human reservoir in maintaining the transmission, but I believe that, personally, I believe that is very important. The other point is that uh, in night transmission setting, if you look at the number of infected individuals, uh, most of the, uh, few of them are going to be, in night transmission setting, are going to be symptomatic. Quite a lot of them are going to be microscopically uh, uh, diagnosable, uh, identifiable, uh, and then a few are going to be submicroscopic. Uh, that means that are below the threshold of microscopy detection. In low transmission setting, although the prevalence may be lower than in high transmission setting, the large majority of infections are submicroscopic. So they can be detected by a microscopy, but they, should, uh, they, they can be detected only by uh, molecular methods detecting the, the, um, the DNA or the RNA of, of, of the parasite. And we know that most of these infections got, have got gametocytes and the gametocytes are the form of the parasite that is transmitted to mosquito, and, um, and the transmission, the onward transmission from human to mosquito depends on, uh, on the parasite uh, density, the gametocyte density in this case, but you see that is a sort of sigma-shaped curve. Uh, you have quite uh, uh, prob high probability of mosquito getting infected uh, when uh, you pass the threshold under gametocytes per microliter, but even be below 100 uh, gametocytes per microliter, the, uh, although the risk of infecting mosquito is low, it's still there. And we have to think that this, uh, the infected uh, people, uh, people with, inf uh, with an infection floating in their blood, they are apparently healthy most of the time, uh, but they are, are keeping this infection for weeks or months, and so you have the, the, the even if the, the, the probability of infecting mosquito is low, um, but you have, they may be bitten several times over a period of, 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 of five or six months, and then may, may infect actually the vector, and then the vector may continue transmission. So uh, I was, uh, so the asymptomatic malaria infection, which apparently now, they're going to be called low density infection, 
defined as infection of uh, uh, a density of, of less than 100 parasites per microliter. Um, so they are about half of the infection are undetected by microscopy, as I was saying, and the difference is greatest in low transmission setting, and then they can persist for a long period of time. And, and the uh, gametocytes are positively associated with no symptom, symptoms and low asexual parasite density. In other words, uh, if an infection is uh, asymptomatic, it's more likely to have also gametocyte, and the mosquitoes are infected with uh, uh, gametocyte density as low as five gametocyte per microliter, and also we have observed transmission, onward transmission, uh, from children to mosquito with uh, children with, uh, with no gametocytemia undetectable, I mean, uh, gametocy gametocyte undetectable by, by molecular methods. So, Having, having said that, having given this, this introduction, uh, I just want to uh, show you what, we are, what, are, what is your, our research program in the Gambia in terms of uh, th research for malaria elimination. And the Gambia is a fantastic place to do this research because it's a, it's a country where that has, has, has done a lot of progress, uh, has decreased substantially the burden of malaria, and also is a country where the bird of malaria is extremely heterogeneous. So you have prevalence as low as less than 1%, for example, here, and then while in the West, and then you have prevalences, this is a survey that was done in November 2012, uh, prevalence as, as almost as 50% in the eastern part of the Gambia. So we wanted to understand uh, the uh, dynamics of transmission, what makes, what maintains this transmission, and uh, who are the people infected, how they infect mosquitoes, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to present a few, a few data, uh, a few results about this. So the first of all, we, d we uh, um, identified six pairs of villages across the Gambia that you see here. Um, so to have a, a sort of breadth of or the difference in terms of, uh, of infection, a transmission intensity of the infection across the country. And um, so this started in 2013 and end in the 2015. We're still analyzing the data, but it consisted in monthly bleeds. So uh, taking a blood sample from all uh, uh, inhabitants of the village every month during the transmission season, uh, so from June to December, and once during the dry season in April, where there's virtually no transmission, and also passive case detection. Uh, uh, and so the following years, 2014 and 2015, we uh, actually did uh, a mass drug administration with uh, the Dutamizumib Paraquin, only one round in June, to see how the, the parasite reservoir would sort of behave uh, f uh, in front of, of this intervention and to see also who got reinfected first after the, the, the intervention. Um, and then, yes, and then similarly we had monthly bleeds and passive case detection uh, at our facility. So this is, these are the result of the 2013 transmission season. I'm going to, so these are the, the months, these are the prevalence here and there. Um, here you have, the, in the boxes, you have the prevalence by month and, and also the, the, the lighter box corresponds to sub-patent infection, so not detected by microscopy, but detected by molecular methods. You see that there is clearly, a, 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 um, two, there are clearly two strata in the Gambia, uh, whereas you have uh, here in the North Bank and also here in the West, you have the prevalence wobbling around during the transmission season, and uh, while in the east, particularly here in the North Bank, you have a classic peak of malaria, which goes up to, uh, I can't read it, but I think it's about 35, 30, almost 40% prevalence uh, during the month of uh, November. Uh, and you have here also, these are the, per the percentage of infection with gametocytes. I mean, here it's a bit varies quite a lot because the, the, the prevalence is, is pretty low, but uh, you can see that the prevalence of gametocyte actually raised during the transmission season, and, and, and also the incidence of infection, not of, of, of clinical cases, uh, uh, raised steadily during, during the transmission season, and then, then they just drops 
um, in December, January. But still, in, uh, in, in April, so there's virtually no transmission during this period, you still have quite a lot of people, or relatively a lot of people, uh, with a malaria infection. And so you have here, for example, something like 10% uh, here, 5%. Uh, uh, here is less than 5%. It's less than 5%. The other thing that is very interesting is that uh, at the beginning of the transmission season, you have uh, something like 5% prevalence of infection just before the transmission start, except here in, in, this, in this part of the country. But then, even like that, you, you see that the, the pattern is, is very different from one region to the other. And we would like to understand why, uh, why this happens. One interesting thing is also that uh, the risk of infection, the, the risk of disease according to infectious status of the people living around you, um, this is actually the risk of pro probability of remaining disease free if you have somebody in your uh, house who is infected at the beginning of the transmission season. And you see that here, for example, if you don't have any infected individual during the transmission season, the risk of, uh, of, of, of uh, remaining disease-free doesn't decrease very much. While if you have uh, uh, somebody infected in your house at the beginning of the transmission season, uh, I'm saying infected and not symptomatic, completely healthy, uh, then you see that you are very likely to experience a malaria attack. So this shows also that the transmission is very clustered. And Ideally, we should try to identify this cluster and possibly uh, eliminate these pockets of, of transmission um, if possible. So we also try to see how the infection uh, between uh, villages and months are related. So we did a, 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 an analysis according to more than 50 SNPs uh, of the genome of the parasite. And so each line corresponds to two infections related to each other. Uh, so these are the villages here, and these are the, the, the months. You see that it's a complete mess, <laughs> a complete mess. Well, so we try to, to actually superimpose these two uh, pies together and try to have a sense of what happens in terms of flow of infection from one part of the country to the other. And this is what we get. So if you think about the Gambia like a, a, a cake, and you do a slice for each month, um, so these you have here uh, uh, July, August, September, October, November, December, and the blue line are the flow from west to east. In other words, they are parasite, inf I mean, infection that uh, are similar according to our analysis and may be related. And then you have, so this, the blue is west to east, and the green is is uh, east to west. Um, actually, we had the uh, previous result were made more sense because a lot of infection seems to come from the eastern part. Here, it doesn't seem to be the case. But still, during the uh, peak transmission season, you have quite a lot of flow uh, from east uh, to west. In any case, it's quite complicated. We are just at the beginning of trying to understand what's going on. But, but as you see, uh, it's, 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 there is a lot of flow, which is important to know because uh, you know, if, if you eliminate malaria in a, in a place, you are likely to have introduction uh, of, of infection from an uh, adjacent place if, if, uh, uh, you know, if a neighbor country or neighbor region, uh, there is still transmission. So this is uh, um, just to show uh, briefly uh, the, uh, what happened with the MDA, with the one dose of uh, uh, one treatment of dizotomizumab piperaquine. And as you see uh, here, you have some, a decrease in the prevalence uh, of, 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 of infection after two, two months, but then infection just restart again afterwards. So I think for MDA, probably the best option would be to have uh, at least three rounds and probably the best option would be to have three rounds uh, during the dry season when there is no transmission in order to clear the reservoir infection before the transmission gets started. Okay, so um, this is a sort of descriptive uh, epidemiology we, we, we are doing. I don't know what, how, what I'm doing with time. Two to five minutes. Oh, okay. Um, 
So just briefly is about uh, a study we did uh, about Prima Queen, uh, uh, two clear gametocytes um, in asymptomatic carriers. Um, and, and so we, we, we tested different doses of primaquine because the effect, uh, the hemolytic effect related to the GC expedit status is dose dependent. And so we, we, we actually, uh, yes, so the, the, the recommendation of WHO are to use a single dose primaquine 0.25 milligram base per kilogram in uncomplicated falciparum malaria in a context of pre-elimination or elimination program. However, uh, it was, I mean, at the time we started the study, we didn't know that if primaquine would have an impact on gametocyte uh, in asymptomatic carriers. And so we did this trial where we uh, identified asymptomatic carriers, randomized them to four groups. Uh, one treated with ditorazomycin piperaquine uh, alone, uh, and the other three groups having different doses of primaquine, 0.20 milligram per kilo, 0.40 milligram per kilo and 0.75 milligram per kilo. By the way, at the time we started the trial, this was the recommended dose by WHO. And here is the percentage of gametocyte carriage. The, um, the prima queen treatment was done at day two here. Um, and here you see the, the artemisium piperaquine alone, uh, the first box or column, uh, and then the other three columns following are the different doses of primaquine. You can see that by day 7, 10, and 14 after treatment, there is a clear impact of, of primaquine on, uh, yes, on malaria. Similarly, for the gametocyte carriage, the uh, risk of gametocyte carriage, it decreased substantially uh, with the different doses of primaquine. So the other things we are doing, this is also in collaboration with a uh, group of uh, anthropology, medical anthropology group at, at the institute here. Uh, is what is called reactive household basal self-administered treatment against the residual malaria transmission, uh, uh, abbreviated as ROST. And I'm going to, it's a cluster randomized trial that try to uh, answer several research questions. And one is, if treating household members of clinical malaria cases would reduce residual parasite carriage, and then if malaria patient and their uh, parents or their fa the family can administer the treatment to the household member or the com compound member if it's socially acceptable and sustainable and uh, uh, what's the impact in the, on the health system and the cost and cost effectiveness. And it's a large trial with 37 village where the prevalence of infection is 5% and the intervention in didotism piperaquine, it's ongoing um, where Basically, a symptomatic individual is identified at the health facility, is given treatment, and also given treatment for the people around him. And then the village health worker follow up this, the treatment after three days and see if there is any issue with the treatment. Uh, the, the second, uh, the other things that we are going to start is to look at the administration of ivermectin. Ivermectin is an endotoxidal, so basically, if somebody has, has been treated with ivermectin and a mosquito bites, this person, the mosquito dies. Uh, and so we are going to want to see what is the effect of ivermectin and the and the paraquine must get drug administration on malaria transmission. Uh, is, 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 a, is a study that has been just funded by the Joint Global Health Trial Scheme, but this is the mathematical model that shows these are the, the rounds of treatment, uh, three rounds of treatment, and this is the prevalence. According to the mathematical model, if it's right, we should have almost zero prevalence at the end of, of, of the intervention. Uh, yeah. So, in conclusion, um, the universal access to standard control intervention, case management, LLIN, so long-lasting societal net, indoor residual spraying, seasonal malaria chemo prevention, intermittent preventive treatment in pregnancy is a priority. Uh, it's crucial to involve local population. With the ROST, with the study we are doing with ROST, that's what we are trying to do. Uh, new intervention needs to be tested, and if, success, if successful, rapidly integrate into malaria control activities. Uh, we need to continue to have political and financial support, even if the, the malaria burden is very low and containing emerging drug and synthetic resistance is a priority. Uh, I would like to show uh, the collaborators here, including Kuhn Peters and his group, Chris Drickley at London School of Gene Tropical Medicine, Tim Basma at Nijmegen, Steve Lindsay at Durham University, and 
uh, I think if there are young scientists here, uh, I would like to encourage them to join us in the fight against malaria. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Umberto, for this great overview of malaria elimination and also all this data from the Glambia. I hope we can also do malaria fight with nonviolent methods. But uh, anyway, uh, I uh, welcome now my co chair to introduce the next speaker. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Soji. Dr. Soji is a medical doctor and a public health specialist. He is also the executive director of, for the African regions for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. As a director, he leads many projects such as Project 5 Alive in Ghana, which is a large quality improvement in Ghanaian health facilities. He also worked on the improvement initiative in Ethiopia and he supported the construction of a Liberian health system after Ebola outbreak. So today Dr. Soji will, is going to talk on achieving impact at scale lesson from Africa. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be part of this 10th conference on tropical medicine and international health. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to uh, my senior colleague, Dr. Bethune, for this kind invitation that has been extended to me. Um, today, I just intend to share, share some of the work that we have done, not just in Ghana, but across um, the Africa region. And I would borrow a little bit from some publication that has been done by the Lancet Commission looking at the future of health in Africa. And I would also focus on Project Fives Alive, which was a specific large-scale initiative that we undertook in Ghana, and then share some of the lessons that are emerging from that, and ultimately talk about some forum that we are organizing in South Africa next year to celebrate the work that is ongoing in Africa. I work for an organization called the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, familiar to some of you, but perhaps not known to the rest of you, is based in Boston um, in the United States, and for 25 years has been leading in quality improvement initiatives globally. IHI has a mission to improve health and healthcare worldwide, and I am privileged to be leading the Africa work. And for 10 years, we've been working through many countries, starting initially in Ghana, South Africa, and Malawi, but now with large-scale initiatives in Ethiopia, in Nigeria and a host of other countries, about 13 in all. And the work continues to spread and we continue to learn and we continue to adapt in the work that we are going in the fields of maternal and child health, in HIV, in tuberculosis, in training, capacity building, and a host of other initiatives that are ongoing. Now to the Lancet Commission publication that came out this year, examining the future of health. They talk about the double burden of disease that we continue to see on the continent. The transition between the traditional situations like malaria, HIV, tuberculosis, maternal and newborn health, to emerging challenges like um, the non-communicable diseases, maternal health, injuries, and difficulties that are emerging from environmental um, changes and then the scourge of the climate change. Progress has been made on a number of the health indicators the Lancet Commission observes. If you take Ghana, for example, between 1990 and up until now, maternal mortality has been halved. The last demographic health survey that was conducted showed that child health had been reduced in terms of mortality by up to 25%. But these improvements notwithstanding, we see a certain reduction as far as improvement is concerned between life expectancy and then the population health indicators, in that we are still lagging behind the figures that are being shown in population health outcomes in, in low and then middle income countries. There's a, a challenge in Africa as far as we are concerned because you see that there's a huge young population that is expected to grow to about 450 million by 2030. So if anything is supposed to change as we move forward in the challenges that are confronting us, we would have to be able to carry this young population along with us. So the recommendation has been for African-based solutions 
led by African scientists working in partnership with the global community using homegrown solutions. And hopefully today, I will be able to share some of that. And the vision outlined in the Commission's report published this year is that Africans should have the same opportunities for long and healthy lives that new technologies, well-functioning health systems, and good governance offer people living on other continents. And a key thing that I'd like to draw attention to is that out of eight action plans that have been outlined in the Commission, they talk about innovation in products, service delivery, and governance. What would it take to attain this future that has been outlined? And the interesting thing is that when one talks about the challenges that are confronting us, when one looks at HIV, when one looks at malaria, even from Umberto's presentation, when one considers tuberculosis and the newborn deaths, there's an amazing amount of evidence that is available. And if we were only able to apply this evidence, there would really not have been any problem. We have antiretrovirals, we have medications to treat malaria. If you talk about the stagnations that many countries in Africa have observed, as far as newborn deaths are concerned, we know that 75% of newborns die in the first week of life. We know that 50% of them are dying in the first day. So, so much is known, and yet the knowledge is not being reliably applied to get improvement in the health outcomes as we would like. I'd like to make reference to this evaluation that was done on an accelerated childhood survival and development program that was undertaken in West Africa. An expansive five-year initiative, and yet at the end of it, looking at the countries where the intervention was undertaken and those where nothing was done, they found that there was no significant difference in the mortality decreases in the intervention and non-intervention areas. There were mixed results as far as coverage of high impact interventions were concerned, no significant improvements in the nutritional status, and a host of other findings that came up. After spending so much resources in carrying out these initiatives. So what then will it take to apply the evidence that one has, not just in a small setting, but across you know, an entire nation, and in some instances, across the entire region of Africa? The first observation that was made, as far as this accelerated childhood survival program was concerned, and in the observations that emerged, was that there was poor coverage of effective treatment interventions for malaria and pneumonia. So although the treatments were known, although the evidence was established that you could use atomism-based combination therapies to treat, there was poor coverage. As far as large-scale implementation is concerned, the implication was reliability. How reliably are we implementing the evidence that we know? They talked about the causes of newborn deaths and the undernutrition not being addressed. So once we knew so much evidence about the causes of these mortalities, the clinical evidence in some instances was not applied at all. Then there were issues around shortages in the stocks of medications. So often in many of the programs that are implemented, the evidence is available, people begin to implement, but then they forget about the system barriers issues about procurement, issues about management, issues about leadership are all not brought on board. And then the programs fail not because of lack of evidence in the efficacy of the inter interventions, but because we do not adequately factor in the system improvements that one needs to take care of. And this is where I come to the specific project example of Project Fives Alive, which we undertook in Ghana, how we went about it, the lessons that we learned and the results that we got from that large scale initiative. So Project Fives Alive was an initiative of five part, four partners, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the Ghana Health Service, the Catholic Health Service, and the Ministry of Health in Ghana. And it aimed to support Ghana as a country to reduce under five deaths, aligned of course to the MDG goal it was a project that was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation 
And the key thing was the application of quality improvement methodology to accelerate improved health outcomes. And it happened between 2007 and 2015. It was a large scale initiative. And what we did was to select three initial districts and ultimately, we moved from three districts to over 100 districts. We worked in an initial nine hospitals and ultimately scaled up to a large number of hospitals. But the advantage was that by starting in three districts, we learned about what worked in a real system, what it takes to overcome the barriers that I mentioned earlier on, and what it takes to actually improve health outcomes. And so the project was you know, implemented in waves. Wave one in those three districts, with two scaling up to 38 districts, and ultimately doing a national scale up. We started with a content theory by asking ourselves, what does it really take to reduce deaths among children less than five? And there we had what we called the key primary drivers. We looked at delays in seeking care, what it takes for them when a mother's child falls ill to come to the hospital very early, and we said that in some instances, even after they have come, we do not treat early. So we said the second key driver would be delay in providing care. And then even when we provide care, are we always reliably applying the treatment protocols? And that led us to the third driver of delay, um, inadequate application of the treatment protocols. So these were the three drivers. And for each of the primary drivers, we came out with secondary drivers. So for example, for delay in seeking care, we would say that there are a lot of sociocultural beliefs and practices that prevent acutely ill children from being brought to the hospital early. For delay in providing care, once they hit the facility, we saw that there are certain delays. We are not having effective triaging systems that are in place that help us to be able to quickly identify critically ill children for prompt care. And then for reliable use of protocols, not everybody actually knows the protocols that are supposed to be used. And so you find out there's a lot of variation in the way one clinician manages from the way the other clinician would manage. What was the methodology that was used? We used what we called an improvement learning collaborative, which some of you I am, I'm sure are aware of. But then this simply helped us to create a peer learning network. So we took the high burden hospitals recording the highest amounts of mortality and put them together. Taught a number of quality improvement tools so that they could diagnose their own system and process failures, brainstorm to generate ideas, and then to go back to their health facilities and to test these ideas in a real system. And we brought about, we defined indicators to be able to assure ourselves that we were recording improvement in all the primary and secondary drivers. So these teams, mainly made up of hospitals, would come together every three to four months. They would share their ideas. They would share their data. They would review their own local performance. And it was not really up to a manager at the regional level or the national level to tell them whether they were improving or not. They could review their own data and make meaning out of it. And over 18 months, we got some very interesting results. So just to give you an example of some of the changes that were happening. This is a hospital that had about 80% of their mortalities happening as a result of malaria. The evidence for what drugs to be used to treat malaria was known, as I keep saying. The question was how were they going to reduce it? And if you look at the first part of the graph, you see the unreliability in the adherence to treatment protocols, which means that so many children were dying from malaria but it was not in every instance that we were applying the correct protocols 100% of the time. So then this, this doctor here is the head of the quality improvement team that was formed within the facility. He now took it upon himself to use his ward rounds to build capacity within nurses, to build capacity among lab technicians, to treat, to be able to diagnose promptly and to be able to treat correctly. So you see very clearly that over time, you see very clearly that over time, there's a, almost 100% adherence to the treatment protocols as far as malaria was concerned. And in this particular hospital, 
over the 18 month period, they reduced under five mortalities by 60%, just by these very simple interventions. This is also a very interesting um, slide. This is a community health officer. This is a community-based assistant or a community volunteer. This is a traditional birth attendant. And the problem that was identified, if you recall, the first driver was that there was a delay in care seeking. So these three are coming together within a learning network. And it's not often you see health professionals interacting with community actors in this way to map out the process. So they drew a simple process map. What happens between the time a woman goes into labor and the time she actually arrives in the health facility? They diagnose the various barriers and that helped them to come up with innovative ideas to be able to drive change. In some instances, what was said was that the women were delivering in the communities because in the communities, they are allowed to squat. In the hospitals, they are made to lie on their backs and some of the women did not like that. So all it took was to be able to make it possible for women to squat if they so wished in the facilities. In one other community, they said that women deliver in the community because when they deliver, they are given a hot drink. In the hospitals, you don't give the women hot drinks. So all it took to be able to push skill delivery rates up was for the facility to use its locally generated funds to provide hot drinks, hot porridges to the women, and they felt much more comfortable to be able to come and deliver in the hospitals. Simple interventions. Here, I just tried to provide a summary of many of the changes that happened. Where you had an ambulance to transport women and children, that was fantastic. But in some communities, this is a, a, a taxi, a public taxi, privately owned. But then it took the community to mobilize, sometimes to put funding aside, so that when the woman went into labor, this taxi driver would take the woman promptly to the hospital to make sure that there was no further delay. And a host of other you know, innovative, simple, low-cost interventions that were deployed in Project 5's Alive. So at the end of the day, we use data to rigorously analyze the effect of all of these changes and to develop what we call a change package. This change package then contained very high impact changes that had been found to have led to improvement. So I talked about the three drivers, delayed care seeking, delay in providing care, adherence to protocols. And these are the various ideas that had been found to be implemented and to have led to actual improvement within those various facilities. And that is what we use for the scale up. So from testing in nine hospitals, we moved to 32 hospitals, ultimately scaled up the change package to 68 hospitals. And by the time the project had ended, this low cost innovative ideas had been scaled up to over 200 hospitals in Ghana at district and then um, regional levels. I'm sure you're asking yourself what the results were. These were the results after the national scale up from the initial nine and when we went to the 140 hospitals by August 2015. Under five mortality, facility based, under five mortality rates had reduced by 35%. Post neonatal infant mortality rates had reduced by 54%. Malaria case fatality rates had reduced by 38%. No new wards had been built. No new doctors or no new nurses had been sent to these facilities. No neonatal intensive care units had been put up. But these were the kinds of innovative, galvanizing community efforts, um, testing reliably and implementing in a way that made sense that had led to these phenomenal results. So what are the lessons that we have learned and would like to share from this work? The first thing is that a good policy environment enables environment. So in some of our more recent work in Liberia, in Malawi, in Ethiopia, in Ghana, you find out that we are working in partnership with the ministries of health to develop and to launch national healthcare quality strategies. And these quality strategies are now given a framework within which these quality improvement initiatives are done so that they stop being project-led activities and actually driven by national health systems to be able to improve our chances of sustainability.
The second thing is that once one develops these policies and says that this is how the country wants to go, the second issue has to do with capacity building. So in many instances, capacity of existing people employed by the health systems are built so that when a small project team departs, the country can continue to implement. If I look at the example of Project Fives Alive, the entire project team was less than 25, and yet we succeeded in doing the national scale up. And the reason that was possible was because there was extensive capacity building. Over 400 quality improvement coaches were trained, leading the work directly with their project just providing support. And so now all of those officers continue to be available to the health system to work, although the project itself is no longer in operation. I can't say enough the lessons that we have learned from testing from a small scale of the system, adapting to various settings, and then scaling up. But really, that is what we did. A lot of the time, I know there's an enormous amount of pressure to scale up. People say the evidence exists. Let us just scale it up nationwide. But you do not often take account of the system barriers that you would come across, the issues around stock up stock out, the issues around lack of management and leadership support. And often, when one tests in a small scale of the health system, you begin to learn what it actually takes to implement reliably in an existing health system. And that is what we have learned over this time. The next question that I would ask, when there's a lot of pressure to scale up, is that what exactly are you scaling up? And what evidence have you built from implementing in the health system to say that you are scaling up. So this is where it is helpful to test, learn, document your learning, and then you can then scale up an evidence-based package that would make a um, difference. The other thing that we have seen is that there's often a tension between whether to build a parallel data system or to rely on the national data set. We decided that we would work with the national data set. Of course, there are data challenges. And so what we did was to be able to develop a protocol to be able to improve the completeness, the timeliness, and the accuracy of the national data system so that we do not have flawed national data systems and then only reliable project data sets. So if we work with the national data systems but we continue to improve the quality of the national data system, by the time we are done, the country's data system overall continues to be strengthened. And then, of course, we have data that shows that in areas where we had strong community engagement, antenatal attendance was much, much stronger. The results were much, much better. So the lesson being that it is important to involve communities in this type of work so that we can get enduring and sustainable results. In many places, as we have come to see, trainings are typically about taking health workers from their facilities to go outside for long periods, long duration trainings, and we have found that they haven't been very helpful because often you are only able to train a limited an, a number of people. You train one or two people who come back to the facility and are not able to effect change among their colleagues. So increasingly through some partnership with Japaigo, we rolled out a low dose high frequency training. And what that meant was that the trainings were delivered in small packages. They were facility-based. They were very practical. We had simulators to be able to carry out the training. And they focused on the training needs of the participants within the health facilities. And we could train all the midwives. We could train all the nurses within the facility. And we realized that that gave us more confidence for how these would then be implemented going forward. And it wasn't a question of one or two people having the skill, but everybody within the facility having the skill to be able to implement in the treatment process. So this was also another key learning, competency-based, case-based, and very practical. So I'm beginning my conclusion slides, and we believe that once we learn a lot from the ways that I have described, we would be able to innovate in an applicable context, we would be able to scale, and we would also, with the capacity that we would have built through strengthening national data systems, we would be able to sustain. And in many places that I've been to, I know that in Namibia, 
they are using this collaborative method and these innovative quality improvement approaches to improve retention in HIV care. In Abuja and also in Lagos, they are using these similar processes to be able to improve care in pediatric HIV. In Ghana, similar processes are ongoing to test how we can adapt these technologies within an existing health system. And all over the African continent, innovative work is happening. And I would use that to draw attention to the Africa Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare, the first which is happening in Durban in South Africa next year in February. And this will be an opportunity really to showcase this work that I'm talking about. A lot of keynote speakers, a lot of abstracts, a lot of oral and poster presentations that will then show the full scale of the work that is happening in many places in Africa. So again, if people are interested in attending, I'll be happy to continue to engage with you. But the fact is that there's a great momentum for change and for improvement in the African continent. And I believe that the work that you're doing here is so significant and ties in very clearly to that momentum. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Dr. Soji, for your nice presentation and for the important information that you gave us. We have time for questions for the two uh, speeches. If we can just ask the two speakers maybe to come on stage, because you will need to use those microphones, and there's a microphone on both sides for the questions. Yes. So uh, thank you for two uh, very interesting and uh, nice presentations. I would like to uh, give a brief comment to the second uh, speaker. Uh, it's of course uh, fantastic to improve quality in uh, hospitals because uh, hospitals, not only Africa but worldwide, are very dangerous places and uh, it's fantastic to try to improve their quality. But if that is your main strategy to reduce uh, child mortality, it is really totally misguided because uh, there is lots of evidence from the reduction in child mortality that uh, many countries where hospitals are terrible, they did uh, uh, manage to have huge reductions in child mortality by community-based interventions. And even your much poorer neighbors than Ghana uh, Mali and uh, Niger did uh, achieve much better reductions in child mortality than Ghana because they focused on community-based uh, interventions. So uh, uh, it's very good to improve quality of care in hospitals, but it's not the right strategy if your aim is to reduce population-wide reduction in child mortality. I thought we were going to take a number of questions, but that is... That is an interesting comment. Um, so there's only so much you can do within 30 minutes. But the project certainly was on a bigger scale beyond hospitals. So actually, there's a whole component of the project that was focused on the community. The hospital component was just one part of it. So I couldn't agree with you more that hospital-based processes alone will be insufficient if our aim was to actually focus on community level or population level outcomes. And we had collaboratives that were simply at the sub-district level, which meant that we had community members working you know, together with health officers who were working at health center level, at a much, much lower level. You know, and that was really where the lot of the community-focused learning came from. Um, so you are right we would need to go beyond hospitals and also influence activities that are ongoing in the community. But PFA, the project did not just focus on hospitals. The work that I presented today just focused on the hospitals, but the entire initiative covered district, sub-districts, community level interventions, so that we truly address the continuum of care. Otherwise, then there was no, no point, including referrals. So I hope that addresses the concern that you have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is for um, Dr. Umberto. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation, quite enlightening. And my question addresses the last parts of I'm Richard Edro from Uganda. 
my uh, question addresses the last part of um, your presentation about the plant trials, which is going to look at ivermectin concurrently with uh, admesin in piperaquine. Uh, and uh, it's intriguing, and I'm using part of the observations we have had in the northern parts of Uganda. Um, we have two interventions going on, and in that area there has been a massive malaria epidemic um, from 2015-2016. Uh, However, this was happening during a period when mass drug administration with ivermectin was occurring. So the country has been implementing mass drug administration with ivermectin where almost everybody, is certainly beyond 60% of the population, is taking it twice a year. In, but concurrently, around that time with failing malaria control programs, they had a massive uh, malaria epidemic. And actually, even as we talk now, although the onchocerciasis burden has been brought down with the ivermectin distribution, the, the community prevalence of, of uh, malaria uh, parastemia is quite high. It's, it's, it's over 40% at any one time. So I, I find it interesting that you are expecting that by administering ivermectin, you may solve these problems concurrently. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think this is a very um, uh, justified questions, question. Um, my natural thought, the ivermectin is an is a issue of dose. Uh, so the ivermectin you're talking about that is, is given for the control of oncocercasis, uh, the dose is, is, is too low. Um, in actual fact, I didn't mention the, the dose that we're going to use, but we're going to use 300 micrograms per kilo per day for three days. Um, there's been a study done in Kenya recently pub, uh, pub presented last year at the American Society of Tropical Medicine Congress where um, with that um, dosage, um, you have a, a killing effect of mosquito for at least 21 days. Um, and so. I agree with you. That, I mean, the ocosercasis um, dosage is not is not is not high enough because uh, ivermectin is eliminated quite quickly, and so the the killing effect of of that dose uh, lasts only for a, for a few days. So this is why uh, we are going to increase the the dosage, and actually we we think according to the data we have, we are going to extend the period of of protection or at least of the killing effect of mosquitoes for at least uh, three, three weeks, three four to four weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentations. My name is Anne Musuva from Population Services Kenya and a previous student of uh, Professor Mbato here at ITM. Um, so it's great to see you on stage today. So I have two questions, one for Professor Mbato and one for Dr. Sotsi. So for Mbato, um, Given the increase in pyrethroid resistance that we are seeing in many parts of Africa and Asia as well, um, yet it's the main component used in the long-lasting treated nets, we are seeing the WHO has been reluctant to recommend um, the use of PBO nets over the uh, LLINs. So which, what is your comment on this given the widespread uh, resistance? And maybe my question to um, Dr. Sotsi, you talked about the intervention, the first intervention that you had, which had limited um, success in terms of improved nutritional outcomes and child health outcomes. Is that any wonder given that the intervention was really focused on, you know, hospital-based approaches? If you're expecting to see nutritional improvement in children, there really must be a multi-sectoral approach where you're also working to improve food security um, issues. Thank you. Okay, for the PBO net, I, I was in Geneva uh, the last three days actually, and we discussed about uh, at the Malaria uh, Policy Advisory Committee. We discussed PBO nets, so there's been there have been delays into um, you know implement putting them uh, into policy and implementing that. But people are well aware, for different reasons, but people are well aware of this problem, and and they are going to be uh, there's going to be a recommendation about that very soon. Okay, so thank you very much. So maybe what I need to clarify is that that Accelerated Childhood Survival Project was not our project. It was a project that was done, but that was published. But we picked up the lessons that came out of that project. And one of the lessons is really what you are drawing attention to, which is that some of the outcomes that you're looking for do not rest in the hospital. They rest in the community, and they, they rest in 
belief systems and, and all that. In our project, we have learned, for example, that in some communities it is believed that a pregnant woman should not be given egg, a pregnant woman should not be allowed to eat meat, you know, all kinds of beliefs. So, so you tackle some of these belief systems, it would not make any difference if you just waited for them to come into the hospital with anemia in pregnancy to manage at that level. And so we would realize that we'll pick children with anemia, we will treat them, transfusion and all that, but they'll go back and we you know these conditions would require. So some of the innovations around it was to be able to create um, mother to mother support groups. So when the women came in, other mothers whose children have suffered similar conditions would talk to them about locally available foods that they could use in their own communities that had nothing to do with the hospital. And then the, we would link them up to the lower centers. So in Ghana, you would have the community health planning services, the CHIPS compounds, which are located within the communities. And then these mothers would then, we would, we would talk about a back referral. So they will be linked up to the community health officers within those CHIPS compounds. And they would conduct home visits and continue with their education on best nutritional practices. So we then moved away from some of these hospital-based approaches that had been found not to work in previous studies and amended our own intervention to provide a continuum of care so that all levels of the health system were really talking to each other. The health center, the district hospital, the referral to a higher hospital at the regional level and ultimately even to the tertiary hospital. And so that linkage was something that we tried to maintain because these solutions really are derived from the community if you want to be sustainable. Okay, we have time for one last question. Thank you very much. Um, it's a question to Dr. Sotsi. <clears throat> I'm Bert Ostwig, I'm a physician from Norway. You talked, you described the fantastic results that you had in the hospitals. We know that hospital staff is often worked out, uh, that worn out and burnt out and demotivated. How did you deal with the motivation factor? Yeah, that, that, that's a very important question. And that was also compounded by the fact that at the beginning of the initiative, people would come to ask and say that, what exactly is your intervention? Are you bringing a car? Are you bringing us more doctors? Are you coming to build an intensive care unit? And you said, no, we are going to help you to solve your own problems. So that really was a mind shift that was a bit difficult to deal with at the beginning because they wanted resources. They wanted protocols. They wanted books, more of the same. And we said, we are not going to do more of the same. We are going to work with these tools so that you understand your system, you introduce changes that make a difference, and you can then celebrate your own successes. I think that was the, the, the most important challenge. But what we then realized was that as people tested small scale changes and recorded improvements, they became empowered by the fact that they could actually change their own system. And I had a very interesting experience where after about a, a year, of implementing this, a data officer came to me and said that, but in reality, we are solving our own problems. You are not the one solving our problems. We are solving our own problems. Did you have to come and teach us to review our data before we could think for ourselves? And this is what a data officer is telling me. You know, so really it's about empowering people to feel that they have a control of their own situation and it is not a district manager or a regional manager or a national officer who is going to review their data and give them feedback, but they are in charge of their own circumstances. The other issue also had to do with linkages to management. Initially, we started off forming these teams, testing changes, but we realized that they tended to be very demotivated whenever they felt that management was either not aware or was not supportive. So, what we then started doing was to be able to draw management members into the collaboratives. So when they discussed some of the changes they needed to make at their level, they had the explicit support of management. There's nothing more disempowering to the frontline workers than bringing them into these collaborative sessions, teach them these tools, they come up with these fantastic ideas they want to test, and they feel like management will not support them to succeed. So we started bringing management members into these conversations, and that really made them feel that this is also a top priority for management. It's not just 
low-level staff struggling to make little changes, but it is a priority to management. And in some instances, it helped to be able to get these officers to present at management meetings, to let them see how you know, these little, little changes were reducing mortality, and in some instances, saving the facilities a lot of um, resources. Because we have a national health insurance in place. If you submitted your claim and there was a mismatch between the diagnosis and the treatment, the facility would lose funds. So by making sure that we were adhering to the correct protocols, the facility was actually gaining resources. And that was then you know, a motivator for them because then they could share these resources across um, some little, little allowances that were, were due them. So these were the very... <laughs> It's time, right? <laughs> I see he's desperately yeah. trying to indicate. But these were some of the ways. But we can continue the conversation afterwards. Too much to talk about. <laughs> I'm sorry to cut short, but I think we really have to hand over uh, the session now to the organizers for the closing ceremony. But thanks very much. I think it was a really good way of, of conclusion to look really for the strengths within rather than always expect help from outside. Thanks very much to the speakers. I think this has been an excellent session.